Welcome back, everyone, to Vox Markets. My name is Paul Hill, and I'm delighted today to be able to speak to Duncan McInnes of Ruffa, one of the UK's finest global investment managers. So welcome, uh, Duncan. Hi, thanks for having me, Paul. Well, we need plenty of your help there today because we've got had a lot of macro information over this past week where, with the uh, interest rate uh, decisions by uh, the Federal Reserve Bank of England and this morning by the Bank of Japan, all deciding to uh, put interest rate hikes on ice um, going forward or certainly uh, in their decision making. Um, so putting all that together, what's your sort of outlook for fixed income equities and the overall sort of broad economy going forward? Well, that, that that is a pretty uh, that is a pretty big and broad question. <laughs> I, <laughs> well, I like to start with the easy ones. I, thanks, Paul. Um, so, yeah, I mean, well, well, I'll start. I'll start waffling, and then sort of we can um, we can we can uh, go in, down different paths from there. So, I think um, if you went back to uh, if you went back to the start of this year, and um, you said to people, um, you would have Fed funds and the Bank of England get above. 5% interest rates, so they continue hiking through the year. That wasn't at all um, expected uh, back, back in December and January. The war in Ukraine would continue to rumble on. You'd have a, a banking crisis in the US in Q1 uh, with three of the top 30 banks uh, in the US uh, going going under. That would spread to Europe, where Credit Suisse would, would disappear in a weekend. Um, the Bank of Japan would end yield curve control so every single uh global central bank would be would be in a in a tightening uh, direction and the gilt market would be back at the trust quarting uh budget crisis lows but we would avoid a recession what 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 do you think markets would do and i defy you to find me someone that would say the nasdaq will be up 30% and the vix volatility would be down 30 to 40% so it's just been such a confounding and challenging year for for everyone. Uh, you know, a lot of active managers are are struggling, in, including us, and we can sort of come come on to that um, because people have just been have been surprised, I think, by the robustness of of asset markets and um, and also by by currencies. You know, currencies in particular have really hurt people, particularly in the UK, because most people have this very large dollar weighting. For us, we've got a decent dollar weighting, but it's more yen actually exposure that we have. Um, but but yen is down eighteen percent against sterling year to date. So that's been been a huge headwind. But everyone is feeling that that um, that pain of the currency conversion effects in their portfolio and not owning. The big seven tech stocks in the US, of course, the indexes have been have been um, very concentrated, um, and um, you'd almost have been mad to have as concentrated positions in the big tech stocks as as is now represented in the index. But that's what you needed to do if you wanted to keep up with the indexes this year. So it's been it's been tough. <laughs> so that's I think that's the sort of backward looking. Yeah, no, I think you're right. I mean, you raise a really good point there. It's it's been a really low probability outcome for this year because, um, as I say, most active managers were sort of like expecting, a, you know, a, a, a sort of tough. I think going into it, a tough first half and a better second half, and it's actually turned out, you know, much different, or yes. significantly different from wh where expectations were. So, and, and also, if, if you like, you say we we avoid recession, rates keep going up. So, what type of equity should do well? Value. You know, that, 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 that's, that should be a scenario where value outperforms growth. Um, and of course, value started relatively cheap uh, compared to growth. So, um, you know, you would, have, you would have put quite a lot of money, I think, and, and many people did, uh, on, on, that, on that outcome. And in, and in fact, as we all know, growth has outperformed value in a particularly concentrated fashion. Yeah. So, so given all that, where how are you positioning the funds in, at Ruffer currently? Because obviously we've now got 5% you can earn just by putting in risk-free cash. We've got sort of like um, pretty stretched valuations in the Magnificent Seven. We've actually got the yeah. US, oh, you know, at about sort of 17, eight, but probably 18 times PE for the next, you know, which is higher than the 10-year average. But we've got the UK below its average on equities. Um, and I think Europe is around about currently where it is, et cetera. So given that, you know, all of the sort of the, the divergences and what the optionalities, and we do now have an alternative investment other than, you know, given the fixed yeah. income has moved yeah. up, how are you positioning the um, the so, rough funds? So briefly, you know, we've we've got about half the portfolio um, in in cash and short dated bonds, which is uh, which is 
certainly the largest exposure we've had to, to something as low risk as that. You know, we're paid, we're paid to take risk and build a portfolio and then we could put it in the lowest risk asset. But it's because, like you say, you're now getting paid uh, very handsomely to take no risk at a time when um when there's an awful lot of macro and geopolitical uh, un uncertainty. We've got our lowest equity weighting in the firm's history. So we're down about 12% in inequities. You know, the average over the course of the 30-year history of the firm is about 40. So very, very low exposure there. We have um, about 10, just over 10% in commodities, oil, copper, and gold. Um, which we think are much more a much more attractive way of expressing risk um, of getting exposure to the economic cycle than equities at this at this stage. Um, but most the most interesting bits of the portfolio are really on the on the protective side. And we can maybe come back to mm. to talk to talk about them later because they're sort of yeah. worth um, worth focusing on. Uh, and we still have um, some longer dated bonds, uh, inflation linked bonds in the UK and. And the US, but I think you, you know, if we could just go back to the high level view of the market, you talked about the US, which I think is you have about twenty times current earnings, uh, eighteen times next year's earnings. If you believe we're going to have ten percent earnings growth, you know, that's, yeah. that's quite a big, quite a big assumption there. Um, I, I think about these things in terms of risk premiums, and the uh, the risk premiums are very tight across the board, particularly in the US. So uh, just very crudely, if you think the cash rate is about five, the earnings yield of the S&P is about five because it's, you know, 20 mm, yeah. earnings invert, inverted and the investment grade index also yields about five because it's a seven years duration or thereabouts plus a 60 basis point uh, credit spread gets you to, to about five. So you have this weird situation where the the capital market line, if you, you think mm. about your exams, should be upward sloping. The further yeah. out this curve you move, the higher the higher a return you get. But in fact, today it's dead flat. There there is no risk premium for moving out. You're, the risk you're dead right. I've, I haven't actually sort of like you know cottoned onto that, but you're absolutely dead right, isn't it? Yeah. Because you, yeah, you normally it's risk and reward go up in a in proportion, but now at the moment you take yeah. more risk and you get no extra return. Yep. So, so you know why why take risk if you don't have to? Um, and and also you know if you think about the U, the, so the UK is the reason we focus on the US is because it makes the point most starkly. Also, the US is sixty odd percent of global benchmarks, isn't it? And yeah. You know, the um, what is it? The US sneezes and the rest of the world catches a cold. It's, it's so big and so influential that I think it, it's hard to be bullish on the rest of the world, um, if you're if you're bearish on the US. Um, although you know, as last year showed, the FTSE was up and the um and the rest of the world was down, but that was quite sort of commodity specific, wasn't it? So that that point of extremely compressed risk premiums, the equity risk premium, can be measured a number of different ways, but. No matter how you cut it, really, it's the lowest it's been since before the financial crisis, and, and some people would say all the way back to to the dot com bubble. So that's that's the bad news for for people who want to be, um, you know, are inclined to buy equities. If you look elsewhere in the world, if you look at the UK or you look at Japan, um, the message isn't quite isn't quite as bearish. So in the UK, base rates are five. The FTSE 100 is probably trading on a P of 11. Yeah, roughly. that's about right. Yeah. So, so that's a, that's an equity. You know, the inverse of that is a is a nine earnings yield. So you've got an equity risk premium of four. That's actually historically pretty pretty average. So so you, UK equities look look attractive, I would say. Um, and Japan, slightly odd circumstance where they're still at zero interest rates and their equity market. Um, probably 12 or 13 times, so, you know, an eight, so a big equity risk premium there. Um, and so if forced to take equity risk, um, I would I would um, look, at least start looking in the direction of, of the UK and Japan. Yeah, no, I think you're right. I mean, they look, do look historically very, um, very good value and cheap. But just now sort of touching on the um, the fixed income side, it'd be fascinating for investors to get an insight. How are you playing that in terms of, are you, are you going to sovereign debt? Are you going which currency? Short yeah. dated, you mentioned, rather than long dated, but but also sort of like, um, you know, you're avoiding the um, the the junk stuff, or how are you actually playing it? Yes. So, um, so the well, the benefit of of the mandate that Ruffer uh, is given by by shareholders and investors is that we can go anywhere and do anything. Um, 
which uh, which allows us enormous flexibility. And if we don't like things, we can just not own them. So um, we own some sovereign bonds uh, in the UK and the US. We have some very short dated Japanese government bonds, but they're really just there for exposure to the yen, which we can talk about later. Uh, we own uh, none uh, in the in the uh, corporate or high uh, credit or high yield space. And in fact, we are short there. So we are... Um, and that's because of the spread risk, is it? Because of the, it's quite narrow. Exactly, yeah. So um, investment grade credit spreads are about 60 basis points right now. So you get 60 basis points above the treasury or, or gilt yield for taking a high quality investment grade credit risk. That is that is pretty low by historical yeah. standards. The the range has been sort of forty five basis points all the way up to sort of one hundred and fifty points of points of stress. And I think there's an interesting sort of money illusion going on here, where people look at a bond from Tesco or a bond from Pfizer, you know, these big safe brand names, and they say that you know, that's yielding seven. That sounds good, <laughs> or or that's yielding six. six well, it has been to we've had, we've, had, we've had a world of negative interest rates for yeah, a couple of years, didn't we? Exactly, exactly. People have been conditioned that that's a very high yield, and it, and it is quite a high yield. But it's the base rate that's doing all the work. Mm. You know, so so the the additional compensation for for uh, taking on the credit risk is is still very low. Um, it's the it's the fact that the Fed funds is at five that's that's getting you all the way up to six or seven. So we we just don't think you're being compensated for that. And, and why fact, why why are the spreads on the investment grade so so narrow? Is it because they're just the corporates because they loaded up on fixed income when it was zero, then that they, they termed it out at sort of like, you know five years, seven years they bought no. forward, and therefore haven't decided like like Houseville has decided not to actually refinance. <laughs> I think I think there's a bit of that. I think there's there's um, and Albert Edwards had a good chart a few weeks ago that went that went viral that showed that big corporates, sort of S and P five hundred sort of corporates, are net beneficiaries of higher rates because exactly what you said, they termed out their debt at lower rates, so they're not feeling the consequences of the higher rates. But the cash that they have on their balance sheet is rolling over in short dated treasuries, and so they're earning. They're earning five on their cash, and they're probably mm. paying three on their on their debt, so that they're um, net winners. That is true, but as with all things, the devil is in the detail, yeah. um, and there's there's major compositional issues there. So if you look at the cash in the S and P, um, it's not evenly distributed. It's all in Berkshire Hathaway, Apple, you know, Google, etc. So those companies are maybe being beneficiaries of the higher rates, but your average S and P company doesn't have net cash, does have lots of debt, will have to refinance and will feel the consequences of the of the higher rates. Also on your why would credit spreads be tight? I think there's a there's quite a bit of complacency in in the market that uh, and we've seen it in the last couple of crises that when things get wobbly in credit markets, central banks ride to the rescue um, and provide various different forms of um implicit or explicit or targeted uh, bailouts to compress spreads to keep markets keep markets functioning. Our belief, and this applies pretty broadly, is that um, that Fed put the Fed backstop under markets does still exist to some extent. You know, they're not going to allow an enormously disorderly market event, but when inflation is above target, which of, of course we're still there. They're, they are hamstrung as to how much they can do. So basically, the Fed puts the Fed's willingness to uh, bail out market participants is further out the money than than people uh, would would like to believe. Yeah. And and, in, and also, in the battle against inflation, I think that the Fed has been pretty explicit that they want to they want to maybe crush is too strong, but they want to constrain animal spirits. You know, they want spreads to be wider. They they want it to. Um, spreads to be wider, it to be harder uh, to um, you know do IPOs, get uh, credit issuance away, because that will that will slow the economy and that will tame inflation. Now that's okay. that's the goal. So if for fifteen years, the mantra that I, I wish we'd stuck to more closely was "Don't fight the Fed." Mm. Um, and you know we did try to fight the Fed a bit, but 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 don't fight the Fed was the right. It was the right approach for the entire ZERP period. Now, 
if you still believe that don't fight the Fed is the correct approach, the Fed wants a lower S&P, wider credit spreads. It doesn't want uh, boom times. It wants to slow the economy. Mm. Okay, so so going forward then, if we're at 5% plus in the US, likewise currently in the UK, and we're still at sort of a negative interest rate slightly in the, in Japan, uh, well, I think we're I think we're at four percent in the um, in Europe. Where where are interest rates heading going forward? Of the sort of developed world, other than Japan, largely topped out now. And and if they have, then how soon are interest rates coming down? If they are at all? Yeah, well, I think I think that that has become the debate. So for the last year, the debate was where is the peak in rates, and um, it seems like we're probably quite close to the peak in, in rates. Uh, the Fed have indicated that they'll do one more hike uh, this year, maybe. The Bank of England, again, m- might might do one or, one or two more, uh, but we're pretty close to the peak. So the new focus of the debate, uh, which is actually more, more impactful, I think, is how long do we stay at the peak for? And so if you go back to the start of this year, the market thought that the Fed would be cutting by now. Yes, they thought they'd be hiking in the first half and cutting in the second half. That's now been priced out, and cuts in the second half of next year are now what the market expects. But the Fed this week said, "Don't be so sure. Um, maybe, maybe money will have to stay tight for longer." And and if you're in uh, Jerome Powell's shoes or any of these um, uh, central bankers' shoes, the truth is that they've actually done a pretty good job, much to my surprise, I have to admit. <laughs> but they have raised rates from zero to five, you know, the most aggressive, globally synchronized tightening cycle in 50 years. They've raised rates 500 basis points very quickly, and they've done it without crashing the market and without causing a recession, and inflation is coming down. Still well above target, still going to be very, very difficult for them to get it back to two, but as of right now, they've done a pretty good job. Mm. Um, just, so just in, the... in this situation, though, why? Because you haven't broken anything yet. Why wouldn't you just say, right? Well, let's just you know, let's pause, but let's stay at this level to make sure that we drain inflation out of the system, because that's ultimately that is all they care about in the, mm. in the long term. Well, it seems as though the US is the economy is is much stronger than people anticipated. I mean, the labour market keeps rolling on and um you know unemployment is what well still less than four percent well but in the yeah. uk we are starting to see cracks in the economy the housing market is starting to roll over a bit you've got higher unemployment and um you know you've got this uh you got rates sorry rents you know property rents going up as well so it's going to be tighter for consumers etc so how do you see the divergence between the two? Because you've seen sterling weaken against the dollar significantly. Maybe some of that's because the Fed's draining liquidity out of the system through its yeah. QT, and we are seeing stresses. It it, it, it it raises my alarms as an investor, the, the, the dollar's you know, strengthening it again. Yeah. Um, I, I, I don't have that much to say. I'm not an economist in terms of the divergences between mm. the two, but... Uh, but... Um, the UK is a more inflation-prone economy. Inflation yeah. will be will be stickier here. Sterling has been weak, well, not not in the last year, but over the course of the last five years, which has which has um, added an inflationary impetus. Um, the US is energy independent, so less impacted by rising commodity prices. So, you know, I think that there are reasons why the US is stronger than the UK that, that makes sense. But of course, as we talked about, the valuations very much reflect that and the yeah. sentiment very much reflects that. But I think we're, um, we're I, I thought you were going with that question was was about how is the slowdown going to start to, to manifest? And that's... Well, let's that, go there, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's been, that's been the sort of really confounding fact this year um, that the uh, recession just hasn't just hasn't appeared um and i think everyone has underestimated milton friedman's old long and variable lags the long and variable lags of monetary policy it takes a while for the the effects of rate hikes to be felt uh, in in uh, in the different sectors of the economy and um we're we're sort of seeing that it's taking a while for people to roll off fixed rate mortgage deals for people to refinance their cars and so on. So um, everyone came into the year um, talking about sort of Wall Street consensus and um, us too, thinking that we would have you know, a rough first half in markets, probably be in recession by 
by the second half. Um, since then, the Wall Street consensus has gone from recession to soft landing to no landing to actually, you know, reacceleration is what we're talking about. It's what we're talking about now. Um, you know, we think that's wrong. We still think we are we are teetering on the edge of of a recession now. But it's very very difficult to know these things. It's um, it's a, it's an incredibly difficult job to be an economist yeah. and to forecast recessions. But also, it's not actually our job. It's not it's not our job. It's not your job as as an investor to predict recessions. The job is to assess you know, the risks, the uncertainties, and then decide how much of that is priced into assets. And um, that's really the, the key. But in our assessment, the market is way too complacent about, mm -hmm. about recession risks. And uh, therefore, it isn't priced in to asset markets. So we're worried that assets, uh, particularly in the US, are vulnerable to to the oncoming recession and why are we going to have this recession well we talked about the um how aggressive um and, and globally synchronized the rate hiking cycle has has been you've got yield curves inverted around the world a historically very good predictor of oncoming recession pmis under 50 um everywhere the the us the uk i uh, came out this morning below 50 uh, Europe is in the sort of 30s. I think you have a very, very low uh, number there. So we are in, in a sort of industrial uh, recession. I think that's um, undeniable. Um, the US Conference Board leading indicator is one of my favorite metrics. That that has a, has a very broad set of inputs that go into it. And it it's deeply negative. It would suggest that we're in recession. And then you look at things like um, the SLUS, the Savings and Loan Officer Survey in the US, which talks about... Um, credit availability or willingness to lend from banks and that too is at levels that you have only seen in in previous recessions so i think if in six months time uh it's revealed that we are in recession and um, everyone will say oh my god i thought we were re-accelerating you know how could we possibly have seen this coming uh the truth is there's a hell of a lot of evidence that, that we could that we could be there or thereabouts and therefore if it happens the market's going to get a big shock yeah I mean, I'm with you. I think um, the expectations, certainly for equities, to uh, reaccelerate on the EPS line to I think it's about two, four, six dollars per share in the S and P 500 for next year. You know, ten percent, eleven percent up is a big leap of faith, to say the least. But uh, well, it, it it is, and that that sort of always tends to be the way, doesn't it? You know, the the um, I think the year after that's forecast for ten percent earnings growth as well. Yeah. So, um, there's a lot of optimism in those in those sell side forecasts for for the for the S and P. Yeah. Okay. So in this uncertain world, and certainly with a lot of it's been priced in for this no landing, how are you, um, you touched on it earlier, how are you positioning in terms of the hedging side and the risk management? Because you were, uh, you know, that so is, I, I think, is a real feature of what you do. Yeah, it, it is a real feature of what we do. And it's, it's, um, it's probably the biggest differentiator, I think, between us and um, several of the other capital preservation uh, trusts that are out there. And this, uh, we call it our sort of unconventional protective toolkit. And mm -hmm. we started building this expertise in 2012 um, when we was when we first started worrying about inflation, really. Yeah. <laughs> so we a little bit premature on, the, on that one. But our, our thinking was um, when inflation returns, which of course it now has, stocks and bonds will become positively correlated. So they'll move in the same direction, which means that your portfolio won't have the sort of hedged, balanced dynamic that it's had that's been so beneficial for the past 30 or uh, 40 years. So I'll see if I can close my outlook so it stops pinging. <laughs> that's um, right. You're um, certainly right on the positive correlation because we had that in spades last year. Ex ex exactly. So so in that environment where um, stocks and bonds are positively correlated and they both fall, you know, nobody's going to be complaining when they're positively correlated to be going up. So 2022 was um, exactly the scenario we we're worried about. Um, and that persisting for for you know years to come. Clearly, bonds aren't really working as a hedge this year; they're down down as well. Um, you need alternative, uncorrelated assets. You know, without getting mm -hmm. too much jargon, you need things that are negatively correlated. You need things that have negative duration, i.e., that will go up when interest rates um, go go up. So um, we we moved into into the derivative space. And, and we've done that very successfully. It's really helped the portfolio in 
uh, whether the, the COVID crash in 2020, where we had positive performance, and in 2022, where we had positive performance. Long preamble, sort of set, set the scene for, I think the outlook for our protective assets is as good today as it was coming into COVID and coming into 2022, because this year, um, they've all got much cheaper. <laughs> so yeah, okay. I, you know, the rougher portfolio has felt some pain, unfortunately. But from this starting point, our protections look very cheap. Um, we think the probability that they will be required is higher because we're closer to to recession, and they have this ability to deliver a very uh, convex or asymmetric payoff from here. So, what's what's in that protective toolkit at the moment? We have the credit protections that I mentioned. So we are short corporate bonds, investment grade, and high yield. Um, and is, is that a naked short, or is it basically you've done it on a pair trade? Well, it, slight, it slightly depends on, on which rougher strategy you're you're talking about, but either we can be long uh, credit default swaps, the, the sort of the yeah. uh, instrument that was made famous by the big short, so that's just being long the spread, or we can own puts on puts on the bonds uh, on the bonds themselves. But effectively, you're betting that those credit spreads that we mentioned, which are not at all reflecting mm -hmm. the, the economic risks and the cash flow risks of higher interest rates, uh, the, the, the spreads will widen. We also have uh, equity puts, so just, just put options that we uh, either use on indexes like the S&P or the NASDAQ. We've also used... Uh, single stock puts or baskets of single stocks in the past that which which, which which sort of stocks is it the banks is it because they're the sort of the 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 hyper sort of like well, volatile yeah, asset class in this there's there's a lot of um there's a lot of economic risk in, in a bank balance sheet of course but the bank equities are blessed with cheap valuations at least mm -hmm. so no, no we're not we're not short of the banks right now we're just using indexes in 2022 we were short uh, a basket of profitless tech um, so that that worked very very well for us then. And um, now it's just it's sort of S and P and and Nasdaq. The other thing that we have re-engaged with, which we used in twenty eighteen and twenty twenty, is volatility calls. So the VIX uh, yeah. index that um, that's that spiked from oh I, I don't know sort of tw twelve to eighty I think yeah during, it was eighty five it topped during out COVID. into. Um, our our options rose forty or fifty fold. Um, we only had sort of ten basis points in them, but an enormously sort of potent protection. We we love that as a hedge uh, because because it, it has the tendency to spike so violently in market crashes. What duration do you do on the um, on those puts index puts? Because if you go further yeah. out, the actual yes. it gets more expensive to buy. You're 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 absolutely right. It becomes more expensive to buy, and it becomes less effective. Because it doesn't it doesn't spike as much. It's, it's the sort of front month that spikes yeah. the most. Um, there's some quite sort of arcane trade secrets about that that I can't really. can't really tell you. But but yeah, I think you're you're thinking along the the right lines that you want to be you want to be closer to the front because you get more uh, bang for your buck if if you are correct. Um, um, and vol volatility call options have been too expensive for the last two or three years, so we haven't used them. The VIX was bouncing around between 20 and 30 for quite a long time. This year it's collapsed mm -hmm. despite um, everything that's gone on in the world. So so that's back in the toolkit as uh, as a potentially very powerful protection. Uh, so that that's good. And also the, the VIX or volatility is an input into equity put option pricing. So that makes the equity puts a bit cheaper than they otherwise would be. So there's a lot of protection offered by those two. The other protection we have is the yen. Um, doesn't feel like much of a protection so far this year, um, because uh, as I said, it's, it's, weakened. Down, it's down. It's down pretty significantly. Well, maybe that does mean it's acted like a protection because it's it's fallen when markets have gone up. Um, but historically, the yen goes up during crises mm. uh, because it tends to be used as a funding currency for speculative trades. So and a store of value, isn't it? And and well, yes, not this year, but yeah, not this year, but it's yeah. supposed to be. So if you think if you think about the financial crisis, um, what happened running into the financial crisis is that everyone was borrowing in yen because it was a very low interest rate compared to the rest of the world, and speculating in emerging markets and property and God knows what else. When the crisis came, they had to sell their risk assets and then buy yen to pay back their yen loan, mm -hmm. and so everyone panicked into the yen, and the yen rose by forty eight percent against sterling in two thousand eight. 
um, because it was a sort of it, it was a, a, a rush to to um, to deleverage. Uh, today, the yen is much cheaper on a sort of purchasing power parity basis or real effective exchange rate basis than it was back in 2008. So we think it's like a coiled spring waiting to rise. Now, sterling isn't as expensive as it was in 2008, but I think the yen could easily rally 25, 30% against, against sterling if we get a big sell-off. We've got 15% of the portfolio in yen cash and, and yen assets, and then we've got an additional 10% exposure via uh, call options. So right. so 25% of the portfolio, um, if that moved 20, 30%, it can have a very big uh, contribution to our portfolio. And just one one anecdote, which I love, which shows how cheap the yen is. We have a, um, uh, an LA-based hedge fund investor. So the hedge fund is mm. invested with, with Ruffer. And I was speaking to one of their analysts um, who is a Singaporean. And he said that his... Um, his uh he and his mates do their uh, online shopping on amazon.jp rather than amazon.com because it's cheaper to buy the stuff in yen and pay for international shipping than it is to buy it in the us wow. <laughs> so, so i think the two conclusions from that are one analysts at hedge funds are clever and two uh the yen is cheap <laughs> so, yeah, okay. so so i think the, the yen is this very cheap asset that has the potential to work very well in a sell-off, and then the last part of our protective toolkit at the moment. Just before we move on, just oh, on yeah. that on that yen call, it's it also sort of you know predicated on the sort of the yield differential because if the Bank of Japan does eventually decide to end, which is a lot of people are speculating, yield curve control, yeah. well, then, they, um, they, yes, you'll see yeah. you, you'll, you'll see a recovery in that in that yield differential, and hopefully that should strengthen the um, the yen, shouldn't it? So yeah, one of the reasons why the yen has been so weak in the last couple of years is because the uh, you know all through 2022 the rest of the world was tightening and the Bank of Japan had yield curve control in place, um, which you know, fixes the bond yield, forces them to do QE, and therefore because the bond yield is fixed, all of the weakness is felt through the currency. Now, I think it was the end of July they sort of called an end to that policy, and actually. I would have expected that to be a bigger catalyst for, for, the, for the yen to go up. And it's been a little bit of a damp squib, but the policy is ending. Um, and what you what that means in reality is that if you take off the cap on the yield curve, you allow the bond yields in Japan to, to uh, go up, you know, catching up a little bit with the rest of the world. Uh, that means the bond prices will go down, um, but you're allowing the weakness to be expressed via the bond market mm -hmm. and it should be um offset by a rising yen because the interest rates that you can yeah. earn yen are now going up so that i mean that is that is a um as clear as day that should be the consequences of the end of yield curve control we haven't quite seen it yet but yeah that's a very sort of uh, uh current and exciting part of the of the yen story because for the, for the first time in a few years Japan is now not heading in the opposite direction on a monetary policy basis than the rest of the world. Yeah, no, I'd agree. I mean, you had, you had basically the politicians deciding everybody was going to get a huge wage hike, didn't you? They just said, right, okay, on mass, everybody could have a, I can't remember, it was 10% or something like that. And, and inflation is now, is now st having had no inflation for 40 years or whatever it is, um, uh, 30 years, um, inflation is starting to become a bit of a political hot potato in, in Japan. Um, so... Uh, yeah, the, the the point is, you know, the grocery prices are rising. They're a big net energy importer. Grocery prices, the cost of living is going up faster than wages, and so the uh, pressure on the Bank of Japan to contain Japanese inflation, raise interest rates, is is definitely increasing. L last thing on Japan, um, I'm sure uh, many of the people listening will have this headache year to date. The Japan stock market has been very strong. Mm. All the money that you've made in the equities you've given back in the currency yeah. <laughs> if you if you if you hadn't if you hadn't hedged it um and that's that's been that's been a, a real pain for a lot of people i think from this point owning the owning the equities unhedged so keeping the yen exposure has the potential to be a sort of double double whammy uh, that that could work for you mm.
Yeah, no, um, I'd agree. And it's trading on about sort of 13 and a half times PE, I think, the Nikkei. So it's not exactly, yeah. um, you know, screamingly expensive. And the the, the sort of equivalent, I, I think it's the sort of equivalent of the um, the FCA in, in Japan. I don't think it was the Ministry of Finance that said this, but they effectively sort of said, if your stock trades below one times book, you're going to have to do some explaining to us. Yes. So it's a very sort of odd, <laughs> yeah. but explicit uh, instruction to companies to get your valuations up, you know, improve corporate, the story that's been around for a few yeah. years, improve your corporate governance, do buybacks, get rid of cross shareholdings, et cetera, et cetera. All the, all the good stuff that, that should result in, in better shareholder returns. Yeah. Well, I mean, they just got to make it easier for people, international investors to put money into Japan. I mean, other than, you know, you can't do, you can't invest in stocks and even in the UK, it's very difficult. As in like, you know, if you're a UK investor trying to get hold of, Whatever it is, I don't know. Nintendo, you have to do it through a fund, or you go through the ADR in the yeah, US. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, you think that's difficult? Uh, try and buy a Japanese short dated government bond. Uh, <laughs> you, you need to. You no, know, seriously. Uh, you need. You need to register with the Ministry of Finance. You, you know, it's just you nuts, almost, isn't it? You almost need a sort of visa. <laughs> yeah, to buy I know. <laughs> Given um, it's a huge stock market, just have those yeah. barriers for international money to come in. I mean, you can understand why people just look elsewhere. So just, just finishing on the, your hedging, you, you said there was the last part yes, of it. Yes, so the, the last one is is, uh, is the portfolio's duration. So I mentioned we've got a lot of the portfolio in very short dated sort of cash proxy bonds, yeah. but we do also still hold uh, the much beleaguered but potentially very attractive long-dated UK index linked gilts and long-dated US tips so the overall portfolio duration today uh, is about four. So uh, you know, for those four that, years, uh, yes. So, so yeah. for, for for the whole port for the whole yeah. portfolio. So a one percent fall in interest rates should yeah. add four percent to the portfolio return. One percent rise in interest rates should hurt the portfolio by by four yeah. percent. So you know, from today, where uh, it's been very volatile the last few days, but the U.S. ten-year bond is is almost at four point five, isn't it? Just yeah, just it is. Yeah, just just gone over. So, so four point five on the U.S. ten year is is interesting, isn't it? You know, that's the highest I think it's been in fifteen years. Um, I think, although we believe we've moved into a secular bond bear market, cyclically, I think duration is an interesting protection right now. So, mm-hmm. let's fast forward three six months and say that we're in we're in recession. Um, the market's down twenty percent or whatever, uh, as as is usually the case during any recession, despite what the sell side tells you um, about soft landings or whatever. Um, I think it's quite likely that um, the U.S. ten-year would trade down to say three point five, uh, maybe, maybe lower, maybe lower than three point five. And so, if that happened, you would get an extra. You you get that portfolio performance kicker from the from the duration. Now, the the reason we don't have much more of it is that um it's a sort of it's a pretty balanced call i think at the moment there's de- there's a strong case you can make that rates will continue to go higher because of all of the spending commitments because of the supply demand dynamics in the government bond market it's just not obvious when the the fed has stepped back the chinese have stepped back the middle east have stepped back who is the buyer for these trillions of dollars worth of treasuries that have to be issued in the coming years so there is a fairly, um, fairly balanced uh, bull versus bear. And you've got the QT as well. They're not not only have to issue a lot. Yeah, they're yeah, getting rid yeah. of them. Yeah, they're net. Yeah, they're not even buying anymore. They're now net selling a hundred billion, uh, hundred billion a month. So, um, it's a it's a really uh, nuanced debate. But I think cyclically, you could see you could see duration working as a as a protection. The next level of the debate is: Do you buy nominal duration or real duration? Mm. Do, you, do you buy the conventional yeah. uh, conventional bonds or do you buy do you buy the tips? The U.S. inflation linked bonds are are trading with a real yield of two point one, I think yeah. today. So you, that's a, I think that's not a bad deal. So you can lend to the global hegemon for inflation plus two point one for the next 10, 20, 30 years as a safe core asset in your portfolio. Um, I think that's I think that's not bad, and it's a very high hurdle for risk assets like equities to compete against, I think. And then the last thing, of course, I'm sure everyone is familiar with this, but um, the UK gilt, uh, I don't think this is attractive on uh, investment uh, merits. But it, <laughs> really? But, but it has huge tax advantages. Yes. So, so every, everyone 
should be thinking with their taxable money. This is not financial advice, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you're right. Um, exactly right. But, yeah. But but, it, but it's interesting from a, from a flow perspective. You know, you should, you should taxable money should be going into a five percent gilt, which is uh, sort of seven percent taxable taxable equivalent. That's a that's a tax free, safe as houses sort of return, which again is a very high hurdle for risk assets to compete against. And this is this is a completely profoundly different environment from the last fifteen years when rates were zero and everyone was forced into riskier and riskier assets, now you can get a very reasonable return taking no risk. Mm. So that the, 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 the risk asset to tempt you into taking risk has to be very, very compelling. Yeah. And there's just not many of them around at the moment, which is why yeah. we're so defensively positioned. Given the macroeconomic uncertainty, the geopolitical uncertainty, it's... Um, it's it's a time to sort of preserve capital. Mm. We think whether the recession, whether the market crisis that comes with it, and then hopefully pounce on the opportunities that come out the other side, yeah. and hopefully make quite a lot of money in the interim period with those unconventional protections that we talked yeah. about. And then then the other part of your portfolio you touched on was the sort of the, your precious metals and your um, you know you got a bit of gold and gold. Yeah. I think a gold stock and you've got a silver stock. You've got um, Agneto Eagle and you've got Trident Royalties and I think uranium you quite like as well. Yeah. So um, yes. Yeah, so, so yeah. I've, if you include the gold and the uranium, probably takes the commodity weighting in the portfolio closer to closer to fifteen, maybe just under fifteen. Yeah. Gold is such a difficult one. So I think there's been no point in Ruffer's history where we've not held some gold. We're about three, four percent today. Um, that's at the low end relative to history. Um, if you go back to the middle of 2020, uh, just before we we uh, had our um, investment in Bitcoin, we were up at 15 mm. in gold. So um, it's very hard to tell if gold is doing well or badly at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> because one camp would say, well, it's quite close to all time highs in pretty much every currency apart from the dollar. Mm. So that's good. Um it is uh it has weathered a huge rise in interest rates and real yields so it's been very robust um yeah that's unusual isn't it you'd expect it to sell off in a yes, in a I rising it, interest rate environment I, I i don't want to be misquoted but i think it's roughly if gold had tracked the move in real yields which historically is very correlated to gold should be more like 1400 1500 mm, yeah. today so gold has been very robust relative to that but on the other hand, we had 40-year highs on in inflation and possibly the beginning of World War III. Mm. And gold was flat. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So where was the fireworks that you should yeah. have got from gold? So I think gold is a very useful long-term part of your portfolio, but it is so unreliable. I think it works on a 10-year view, on a five-year view, but you just you never know what it's going to do from one quarter or year to the next. It's like then, my stock portfolio. It's exactly <laughs> the same. And then, and then in the equity, you you have to choose between bullion and gold equities. So, um, gold equities adds an extra layer of uncertainty to that. Yeah. But they are very cheap. Yeah. As the the sort of price of an ounce in the ground relative to an ounce in your hand is, is about as uh, the gap there is about as wide as it's ever been. So the the equities are very very cheap, but. They face a very difficult operating environment. Their costs are going up, energy, labor, regulatory, permitting, ESG, all, all of these are big, big headwinds, which which should be you know, a headache for the equities, but probably bullish for the commodity. Yeah. You need I think with the stocks, you certainly need to be in a safe geopolitical region, don't you? Because you get a lot like confiscation by yes. uh, and, and African, the valuations. Uh, Africa and uh, South America. Yeah, the valuations reflect that as well. That that is, you you definitely pay a higher price for for the for the good jurisdictions. And uranium, uh, briefly, has done very very well recently. Uh, has had a had a um, strong. How are you playing that with the with the commodity or through effectively things like Cameco and people like so that? We, we own uh, in Rougher Investment Company. We own uh, Yellow Key, which is the okay. London list London listed holding yeah, okay. vehicle uh, for the physical commodity. Still, despite I think it's very interesting that despite its strong run, it's still on a discount to Nav. You know, so the share the share price the share price is running yeah. and the uranium price is running, but the share price isn't running hard enough to keep up with the with yeah. the uranium price. So that that's um I'm not sure if I would be a buyer of that today, having having run so hard, but as a secular story, 
there's just a really interesting supply demand mismatch there mm -hmm. where even at the current prices most miners are not profitable uh, yeah. you know, can't really turn on production demand is going up uh, from china and from the west waking up to the fact that that uh you know whether we like it or not nuclear is probably part of the solution because it doesn't have the intermittency issues for example that all, all renewables do so um yeah i think possibly uh, uh uranium is a really interesting idea but um i don't want to say we've missed it but um yeah. It's. It would not surprise me if I had a pullback after such a strong, such a strong rally, and and maybe the, um, uh, the the discount on yellow cake sort of speaks to the broader, what mm. was closed ended fund investment trust world, um, discount problem that is yeah. ongoing at the moment. And that, it does rough have that issue at all in terms of how to close that discount. So on rougher investment company, yeah. So, so, so Ruffer Investment Company launched in 2004. Ruffer itself goes back to 1994. Um, and we've only had a discount four times in the in the history of the trust. In 2000, and, and we're on a discount today of about 4%, um, which is which is narrow relative yes. to the investment trust world, but pretty wide and scary relative to our own history. And, uh, and of course, the discount control is a board uh, as a board decision, not a not a rougher decision. Uh, to be clear on that, but back in uh, two thousand six, the board at the time chose to do a tender offer, and we bought back. I think it was eighteen percent of the shares outstanding in one go, letting anyone who wanted to exit exit at NAV, which I think mm -hmm. was a a really um, good piece of corporate governance uh, and treating shareholders fairly, and that's always been our uh, been our intention. This time round, we've drifted out to a discount because of the sectoral issues, but also because the performance this year has been has been less good than the last couple of years. Um, and last month we did our first ever uh, buyback, so it wasn't it wasn't huge, uh, but it was it was a it was a stake in the ground I think from the board yeah. uh, that that we are uh, more than willing to act to um, to close discounts. We were happy to issue shares when we were at a premium. It's only right that we should. Buy shares back uh, at a discount uh, because it's accretive to remaining shareholders and because it's the right thing to do. Also, we hold shares in various investment trusts within Ruffer Investment Company, and many of them are trading at discounts. And it's if I'm going out telling those management teams that they need to do something to improve <laughs> to improve yeah. the discount, you know, then you have to get your own house in order first. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And what about um, the the oil sector? Is a lot, you know, your BPs and people like that, because um, China is is again sort of confounded a lot of people. They thought it was going to be like a, a roaring uh, the roaring dragon again, and really sort of you know get going after the lockdown from last year. And that's been a damp squib. In fact, they're really quite struggling with the property sector. Yeah. What do you, how do you see oil? Because essentially, the, again, the equities trade at really but low valuation, seven and a half times for BP. I think yeah. its cash flow yields twelve percent. Uh, yeah, I, I think at least given given the run given the run up in the oil price, I, I think yeah. it might be higher than that. Yeah. So, um, well, actually, the share price has gone up quite a bit, but yeah, yeah, I think yeah. I still think it might be higher than that. So, um, yeah, we've been uh, big uh, energy investors since um, uh, twenty twenty. Uh, we we've um, enjoyed the the rise in BP and Shell um, and several of the smaller companies like Chesapeake or Pioneer. Uh, since uh, since then, um, in Q4 last year, we took a bit of the energy equity exposure out and replaced it with um, direct oil exposure. Mm -hmm. So owning, owning oil versus via the exchange traded commodity rather than uh, rather than the equities. We Not the physical. You haven't got physical oil. You've basically got through a derivative, have you? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's, okay. That's, just going to say, right. I'm going to be yeah. that. that no. is, uh... the, the office, the office in Charlotte Square in Victoria Street is not stacked with you know yeah, exactly hundred thousand barrels leaking everywhere. I think that would that would put the insurance premium on the office up a bit. Um. So um. No. So we own we own the oil uh, directly, and the reason that we did that was um, we still think the uh well we owned the oil as a sort of hedge against economic deterioration mm. our sort of thinking was well if the economy stays on the road how is that going to happen well it's going to happen with um 
particularly Chinese fiscal stimulus, but fiscal stimulus everywhere, you know, things like the Inflation Reduction Act in the US. And that's going to be good for commodity demand. So we bought oil and we bought copper um, via via uh, derivatives. Uh, the other benefit was that the um, the slope of the commodity forward curve, mm. uh, I always get this wrong, was a downward sloping, whether that's yeah. contangle or backwardation, I'll, yeah, I'll, okay. I'll never remember. But it was downward sloping, which meant that you actually... Um, you you received a roll yield, a positive yes. roll yield. So you got paid paid on the commodity, which is not uh, that often the case. Um, and owning the commodity is not vulnerable to um, the multiple contraction that we were worried about in the equity market, mm-hmm. even though the equities were were cheap. And lastly, if you think this is saving oil was seventy or eighty bucks, if you think um, it can uh, squeeze higher, you know, sort of. Uh, from 70 bucks to 100 bucks is 50% upside. Mm. It, it's unlikely that you get 50% upside in the equities yeah. uh, during that move because, of course, they're, yes. they're discounting 20, 30 years worth of oil production uh, rather than it all being squeezed into this year. So that was why we we made that move. Um, it, it's not quite worked out as we wanted and until recently. So up until about a month ago, oil was flat on the year and equities were up lots. Mm. Uh, but, but it's come to life recently and has been been helpful to the portfolio. But I, I just think oil is a great... Um, and in fact, you, your interview with uh, Kartik Kumar, mm. he, he made exactly the same point. If you only run an equity portfolio, which of course we don't, but oil is a great hedge to have in your portfolio because it's, it's, a, it's exposure to GDP. Mm. It's a hedge against inflation. You know, it's sort of it is inflation to a large degree. It's a hedge against uh, geopolitical risk. It's a hedge against the war in Russia, Ukraine. Um, it's it's very useful in a lot of bad economic scenarios. And the fact that you can get exposure to that either, either via the commodity or via BP, whilst it's returning, you know, four percent dividend yield and a four percent buyback yield, and and mm-hmm. uh, growing its renewable business. Is, uh, is is really attractive and useful, I think. Yeah, no, I would agree. It looks like a, a, a very good value play generating a shed load of cash from paying big dividends. So I'm not sure what there's, lo- there's nothing, to lo- nothing to dislike there, I don't think. Yeah. Now, just on the, the finally then, at the other side of the spectrum in the equity world, you've got a few, but not much on the mega caps. You've got sort of Amazon in there, TMMC and Alibaba, et cetera. Do you, do you just give us a sort of quick whiz through, you know, what, why you've gone for those, but also sort of like... Um, you, you, you position in mega tech because obviously if you're cautious then uh, and i can see why you're waiting yeah. into mega cap tech is pretty low yeah yeah I, mean, I don't want to make too too much of this i'd probably split split them out so tsms but i don't want to make too much of it because the position sizes are quite small, small yeah um even in the context of our low equity weighting uh, i would split out tsmc and alibaba you know very clearly both both asian uh yeah. asian mega caps uh, TSMC sort of benefits from a super super cycle in uh, in semis. Baba and in, is... and in Nvidia as well. I think it has a very good relationship with those yeah. guys, doesn't it? Does well, all their sort of like their their super fast chips. I can only hope it piggybacks on the Nvidia share price. Yeah, performance. yeah. Uh, but Baba is an interesting one because uh, it's pretty much back to the price that it IPO'd at, mm. but it's it's something like five times bigger in terms of in terms of sales and. Uh, sales and operating profit there are clear corporate governance issues there um yeah. and I, my colleague uh, alex charter is always sort of and i to- totally agree with this um i don't think you can own these businesses you can trade them mm-hmm. um there is there is a similar risk um to to what was experienced in people uh, not us thankfully who owned russian assets yes so w- woke up one morning and all of a sudden it was worth zero yeah. so um, Alibaba is a little bit of a trading chip, I would say. Mm-hmm. We are playing the fact that the Chinese government is in pretty dire straits at the moment, like you said. Um, they want to stimulate. They're sort of running out of road in terms of um, building bridges to nowhere, empty cities and all that sort of stuff. And the latest iteration of their um, uh, policy stimulus appears to be more financial market orientated mm-hmm. um, and and Baba is just a very nice big liquid way of, of yeah. playing that um, in terms of in terms of Amazon um, we've uh, you know we we have historically uh, had a reputation as sort of tech bashers like I said we were we were short profitless tech uh, last year um, we 
it's a bit of an unfair reputation because at some point in the last decade, we have owned Google, we have owned uh, Apple, we today own Meta, formerly Facebook, and we own uh, we own Amazon. I think um, the the Meta journey is almost over. That that was a sort of extreme sentiment revulsion against the stock, um, and there was quite a binary situation, wasn't there? If Mark Zuckerberg turned off yeah. or turned down the spending on the metaverse then the true profitability of Facebook was enormous and the valuation was very low. Um, the stock had rallied a long way since then. Um, Amazon um, is uh, is complicated. Um, of course, the, the the sort of the jewel in the crown is AWS um, and uh, you know, cloud spending continues to grow. Uh, but actually on the, on the retail side of the business, we think that the, the profitability or the margin there is uh, is masked um, by a whole bunch of sort of you know one-off expenditures and COVID disruption and so on. But as they transition to being more of a logistics provider, a third party, a, a host for third party sales, the margin is higher than on their um, uh, original sort of re- retailing business. Yeah. Okay. Good. But these are these are these are not uh, these are not huge positions. Yeah, uh, I know. Yeah. Yeah. If, so, so, so just finishing off then, if if you're right, and we are going to see sort of like cracks in the economy, and we're going to get a bit of a sell off next year, which I can absolutely see myself. If interest rates stay higher for longer, particularly in the US, you're going to get multiple compression, even if you do get the APS increase of ten percent, because it just won't stomach, uh, you know, sort of like that n- n- zero equity bearish premium, and you're probably yeah. like to see the corporate bond spreads also wide. And if they have to start issuing and you start delinquencies going up and all that. So if you, if you spot on and you're right, when are you going to get back in and start loading up on risk? Um, easy question. I just start, I started no, with an easy no, question. I, I think, I think that, so what, what would be, yeah, what would make us bullish? Um, yeah. And some um, cynics might say rougher will never be bullish, but I promise you, I look forward <laughs> to the day that we're bullish. There's, there's been times when we've been very bullish on things, very bullish on the protections today. Um, so I, I think significantly lower prices, all other things being equal, will of course make make us make us more equity make, risk premium going up. Equity risk, yeah, great way of phrasing it. Yeah, equity risk premium going up because you know if the if interest rates end up at eight and the stock market uh, ends up a bit cheaper, the eight percent cash is still probably the better investment. So equity risk premium or other risk premiums widening making it more attractive to take risk um once we have the recession i think that the key element is the response the policy response to the recession so and our expectation would be that the policy response will be the fiscal bazooka Mm. so you get massive government expenditure to tackle the big society issues things like the energy transition things like wealth inequality and when that fiscal impulse is hitting the economy, that's probably pretty good for equities. Haven't, it's all, also, the government, haven't, all, the government, haven't all the governments, though, fired their bullets? I mean, you've got the US now at about 120% you know, debt to GDP. You've got the UK at 100. You know, you get, you, you're going to yeah. get into uh, into really sort of rarefied territory. Yeah. It, yeah. I, I, yeah, I think I think that's... We're not in Kansas anymore, Paul. <laughs> I know, <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's where, that's where we're going. Uh, yeah, no. So our our, our view um, would be, yeah, that is exactly what happens. We we head towards a world of the baton being passed from monetary policy to fiscal policy, or 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 the coordination of monetary and fiscal policy. So, yeah, I'm not predicting it, but it wouldn't surprise me if we end up having eventually. I'm not talking the next six to twelve months, but yield curve control in the US or the UK or something something like it. The co option of the big pools of capital, like the pension funds, you know. Uh, Pension funds should buy should buy guilt. You know that's how, that's how you create the buyer that we say doesn't exist. Yeah. That sort of thing. So, um, governments, policymakers can be incredibly creative at finding ways to finance the things that they want to do. And yeah. um, when it's something as important as uh, you know wealth inequality or the energy transition or whatever, um, then I think. Um, what was it, Dick Cheney that said the deficits don't matter? Clearly, they do matter, mm-hmm. but that you know that reveals some of the mentality and the willingness. Politicians like spending money on things, so we've talked about it for a couple of years. You want to be, you want to get in front of the the money fire hose. The, go- the government's money yeah. fire hose is going to be sprayed onto the economy to try and fix our ills. Um, that can only be done from a point of crisis. It can't be done today. 
because inflation is too high, because we don't have a crisis. But if we head into a recession and the market's on its knees, then people will very willingly allow the government to get their big checkbook out again. And that's that's when you move into the more inflationary world. And that's when you you probably want to be back in risk assets. Yeah. You raise a really good point there. Because so what you're effectively saying is that on the fundamentals, you want a higher equity risk premium, which you'll get if the markets fall. But the thing you're looking for, the trigger of that position, you know, to, to, to move into risk assets is is essentially a crisis that will lead that bazooka from the federal yeah. banks. Yeah. Yeah, well, so it's a tale as old as time, isn't it? You know, buy yeah. when there's blood on the streets. Uh, that's that's the but, opportunity. Well, it worked. It worked in March 2020, and certainly worked to the great financial crisis in March uh, uh, 2009. I think it was when we hit the bottom of the FTSE. So, uh, yeah, I'll be watching for that myself if we uh, if we do. But it, it's easier said than done, isn't it, to move when there's a crisis because the uh, risk yeah. is so elevated. Well, it it is. I mean, this is, I think, how how we help ourselves is that because we have this all weather portfolio this sort of natural capital preservation approach we don't we don't have the big drawdowns mm. to, to, to touch with the biggest drawdown in the history of the firm is 10 percent. so yeah. if your portfolio is down 50 percent, it it's incredibly difficult if not impossible to try and buy the dip because mm. you're 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 hemorrhaging money if, if you're only down a couple of percent or as we've always been up in crises then you can be on the front foot very easily. Yeah. For us, the more uncomfortable environments are like today <laughs> or, yeah. 20, or 2021 when everyone's making money and we look silly. We we actually tend have tended to thrive in, in the crises, which is, uh, you know, sort of maybe ending on a sales pitch here, uh, which is why why people hold us. You know, we, we're a, we, we are a hedge in people's portfolio that hopefully is boring in the good times um, less exciting than your equities, but you know, okay, but but very effective and goes up when the market goes down. Yeah, well, it certainly hasn't been boring talking to you there, D- uh, Duncan. <laughs> and I would highlight to investors, you've just raised a fantastic point. I mean, I've been investing for thirty years, and certainly, as you you know, you've structured your portfolio, you've bought effectively insurance cheaply for the day it does rain. And when it rains, that insurance is going to pay out and give you optionality going forward. And I've always struggled in terms of buying that that level of insurance. And then the downturns, yes, I might have had a bit of cash, but you're right. It makes it extremely difficult at that point to take advantage of the real downturns because yeah. my portfolio was down 35% in March 2020, like most people, as it all crashed. Yeah. But, yeah. but but you're right. So uh, you know, well, you're, again, you're very modest because I saw your uh, long-term returns the other day on LinkedIn. You know, they're, they're they're pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but just wait until the next crisis. So <laughs> it will happen very soon. Okay, well, thanks again, um, Duncan, and um, look really look forward in uh, in touching base. In uh, well, oh, I'm, by the way, how how do people invest in your funds? How best to do that? Uh, well, so so Ruffer have uh, there's a number of ways. There's uh, Ruffer Investment Company, which you know, yeah. we're talking about today, which is just a London listed investment trust. Uh, we also have some open ended funds. The Ruffer Diversified Return Fund is available on all all the uh, major platforms, and we have a, a wealth management business for sort of high net worth uh, individuals. Brilliant. Okay. Well, thanks very yeah. much. Thanks very much again. I look forward to touching base in six months' time. Cheers. Bye. <laughs>